I'm going to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Randy Townsend, who many of you know. He knows pretty much everybody. He is currently the president of SSP. Uh, he's a faculty member of our graduate program and a graduate of the program. He teaches our ethics course, as he'll probably tell you. And um, Randy, it's wonderful working with you in a lot of ways, and I'm glad you were able to come and moderate this panel for us today. Thanks, John. I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I was not going to do slides, but for those that do know me, um, they I think you all know I'm, I'm death by PowerPoint. Um, and for all my students that are attending, I'm sure you're not surprised to see me open with a quote from Nelson Mandela. Um, Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. As a proud alumnus of the Masters of Professional Studies program at George Washington University, I have a very biased opinion about how valuable it is to our industry. So I'll mention a few quick facts. The program includes students from all walks of life, some fresh out of undergrad, some experienced professionals, some early career, some undertaking professional reinvention. The cohorts develop unique, unique bonds that continue on well past the completion of the program. If you attended yesterday's session, it's likely that you're already part of the conversations that influence the way in which our industry evolves. The Capstone Project is the cornerstone of the ethics and publishing class, designed to encourage the exploration of an issue that connects students' professional passion with industry topics. These projects often take students on a very special journey that teases their individual moral compass, expands their understandings of the topics, and allows them to navigate ethical deliberations. This morning, you'll hear about book bans, AI, and YA fiction. I'm proud to introduce four students who will share the results of their capstone projects. Haley Baker, graduated from Sonoma State University with a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration. She's a member of cohort 18 and will graduate in May of 2025. She has spent several years in customer service, administrative, accounting, and human resources roles in a variety of fields. She is currently working with the GW Journal of Ethics and Publishing on the Strategy and Sustainability Committee. Tara Jacoby is the editor of the San Luis Obispo County Bar Association's Law Journal and second year graduate student in the Master of Publishing program at the George Washington University. She's also a proud graduate of Pace University School of Law with a certificate in international law from the University College London. She practiced law in the private sector before transitioning to nonprofit and government work. Jay Soglo is a production court con controller at John Hopkins University Press and a member of cohort 17, graduating this fall. He's still early on in his publishing career after changing careers from sponsored project man projects administration. Passionate about the future of digital publishing, he's currently curious about accessibility and about the impacts of generative AI on the publishing industry. Violet Lane Ruckman is a proud member of cohort 17 and a half. I don't know if you all hear how many people are proud of this program, but um, it's not just me. Um, but Violet is finishing up her last semester at the GW Masters of Publishing program. Currently, she's living in DC and working costumes and wardrobe for regional theaters until she breaks into publishing. Those of you that are hiring, don't be shy. I guarantee you won't be sorry. Please submit your questions um, after or throughout this, this uh, presentation. Uh, there should be time for discussion after Violet's presentation, but for now, I'm going to turn it over to Haley. Hello, I am presenting today from Bountiful, Utah, which uh, was home to the Kumumba tribe and also part uh, the greater part of the um, Ute tribe. I am presenting today on book challenges and bans in the United States. 
First, I'd like to point out that no one is debating the rights of parents or caregivers to curate what materials are given to their children. I think everyone can agree that parents need to be involved in their kids' education and should be aware of what content they are consuming. That, however, is not what is happening with the book bans that are currently being enacted. The American Library Association has recorded the highest number of attempted book bans since the ALA began compiling data about censorship in libraries more than 20 years ago. The unparalleled number of reported book challenges in 2022 nearly doubles the 729 challenges reported in 2021. Also keep in mind, all reporting to the ALA is strictly voluntary. This means that the numbers we are seeing are likely not the full scope of what is actually happening. This is particularly rampant in traditionally conservative areas of the country. Access to books is becoming dependent upon where you live and representation in literature is becoming a token of belonging to the historical majority. Many of these bands originate from the same groups and individuals. These groups are relatively small and often don't reflect the views of the majority. History is being suppressed and even removed to appease these groups of people. A recently conducted poll found that 70% of people in the United States oppose book banning, yet the bans continue. The bans are often sweeping without clear guidelines and implemented with short time frames. There are processes for reviewing books that have been challenged. Those established procedures are being sidestepped in the rush to appease this vocal minority. There are books on the list that most certainly do not meet the established criteria. This results in books being pulled and even whole libraries being shuttered to err on the side of caution. The books most often challenged are regarding racial themes, LGBTQ plus themes, death, grief, sexual assault, physical abuse, teen pregnancy, abortion, health and wellness, puberty, and suicide. If these groups that are seeking bans claim children are being exposed, endangered, or victimized in some fashion, they are more likely to get their way and it will happen at a much more rapid pace. In April of this year, PEN America published an extensive report on the current state of book bans. I encourage you to read through it. It is very interesting. The report explains, the legal test for obscenity requires a holistic evaluation of the material. Over the last year, however, terminology such as obscene, pornographic, harmful to minors, and sexually explicit are being utilized to restrict a range of content. Books are frequently targeted for short excerpts or even single images without the holistic evaluation necessary to understand their literary merits. By taking short passages and single images out of context and presenting them as evidence, groups are employing an angle that uses hyperbole and misdirection as means to an expedited end. Along with the book challenges that have been occurring, librarians have been the victims of violent threats and behaviors. Let's be clear, this isn't parents selecting content that is appropriate for their children. It's people with certain agendas deciding some stories should not be told and some information should not be available to anyone. These are blatant scare tactics to harass and abuse people with opposing views into submission. Instead of following the established rules, regulation, and laws, they are resorting to vigilante justice to advance their cause. America Report has identified a minimum of 50 groups involved in pushing for book bans across the country, operating at the national, state, or local levels. Of those 50 groups, eight have local or regional chapters that between them number at least 300 in total. Some of these operate predominantly through social media. Most of these groups appear to have formed since 2021. These parent and community groups have played a role in at least half of the book bans enacted across the country during the 2021 to 22 school year. 
These groups often distribute lists of books they are targeting throughout the country electronically, for example, on social media platforms. These local chapters take that information to their schools and libraries. These challenges are often made without the challenger ever having read the books, but simply citing the information provided to them. These groups are targeting books for young people based on their own personal traditions, morals, religious ideologies, and political views. The Wall Street Journal reports that more than 40% of books removed from school libraries nationwide until June 2022 involved LGBT identity themes, and more than 20% addressed issues of race or racism. People, especially children, need to see themselves represented. Limiting or denying access to books that depict a wide variety of people, backgrounds, ideologies, ethnicities, races, and so on, is damaging to everyone, especially youth, when they believe that there is something about them that needs to be suppressed. Also, the harsh reality is, for many communities, the only access to books is the public or school library. When those resources are taken away, there is nowhere else to turn. What gets lost in all the talk of book bans and censorship is the public library's role in the First Amendment and intellectual freedom. Its mission as an institution is to uphold these rights granted to US citizens. Censorship is not illegal unless the government does it. If the government attempts to ban certain viewpoints, that is an infringement on the freedom of speech. The government can regulate the time and place of free speech, but not its content. When individuals, companies, and organizations engage in censorship, that is likewise not illegal. This also applies to state and local governments' regulation of what books are available to their constituents. They have final say in their curriculum unless it's found to violate the Constitution. This is where the gray area occurs in determining what is legitimate curation of materials for schools and libraries and what is the state and local government's infringement on citizens' rights. There are several organizations, such as Banned Books Week, PEN America, and Foundation 451, that are combating the effects of book bans. Many have outreach campaigns to bring awareness and get books into the public's hands. An article written for librarians called How to Fight Book Bans and Challenges, an Anti-Censorship Toolkit by Kelly Jensen proposed a different approach. She writes, consider ditching celebrations of Banned Books Week, rebrand the concept as Intellectual Freedom Week or a week dedicated to protecting the First Amendment. Get rid of the week-long festival altogether and instead focus on working these issues into everyday discourse as intellectual freedom or, to put an even finer point on it, upholding the First Amendment rights guaranteed to all U.S. citizens. By highlighting banned or challenged books, you give more attention to those who want to uphold white supremacist ideals, even if the intention is to showcase the books. Just put the books on display all year long. Make those displays when it is unexpected and give it a non-banned books theme. Get all of this in front of all your citizens all the time, rather than the one time that's seen as the right time. As I have spent time on this topic over the last several months, I believe there is a need for both movements. It is necessary to call out book bans and get the process under control. This can and should be accomplished with awareness campaigns and legal action by those with resources. On the other hand, advocating support for the First Amendment, campaigning for literacy and promoting education can also bring about change and stop this type of censorship. My proposal for combating book banning in the United States is to create a national digital public library this bypasses local and state politics that are impeding access to books. It would be stocked with books that are cur curated by qualified librarians to bring stories and information to people that do not have access. This would be accessible on a website or from an app on smartphones, tablets, computers, e-readers, etc. There would be grants for individuals of 
lower income status to apply for free or reduced cost e-readers. According to the American Library Association's website, there are varying degrees of accessibility to materials and privacy granted by individual jurisdictions for minors. In this case, my recommendation will be to have minors obtain permission to use the service from parents or legal guardians. Unfortunately, this does limit the access for minors to material that would be beneficial to their educational and developmental needs. However, it will be better to err on the side of caution in obtaining parental consent. In the cases where minors are applying to obtain a digital library card, parents will be able to select different options of genres and age ranges that they feel are acceptable for their child. If anyone is interested in reading my full report or has any questions, feel free to email me. Thank you. So I did my capstone project for Professor Randy's uh, ethics class on why AI cannot be considered to be an author of literature. My project has three parts. The first part focuses on what is the definition of an author? And this focus there is on what is the legal definition of an author? The second part looks at how is AI producing literature today? And also how are writers, professional writers mostly, using AI today? And the third part looks at, well, what makes for great literature? So in the second slide, um, I took a look at um, particularly what is the definition of an author? And I wanted to look at what is the legal definition of an author? So in other words, what does it mean to have rights to a written work that you produce? And when I, I thought of that, I initially went to thinking about my copyright class that I had taken before in this program as well. And, um, and you think about copyright law, well, you go to the source and our, our source of uh, US copyright law is the United States Constitution. But unfortunately in the US Constitution, there is no definition of author. It doesn't provide us with a definition of well, what does it mean to be an author? And if we look at our federal copyright law act and the case law that has come about from that, from interpreting that act, the definition of author is implied. So um, it kind of implies that an author must be a human being. Um, for instance, I know the Authors Guild takes the position that if you go through the case law on copyright, um, it definitely is implied that the and an author is a human being. But where I found in my research, the most definitive answer of what does it mean to be a legal author of work is in the US Copyright Office's Statements of Policies. The U.S. Copyright Office issues statements of policies pretty much to help individuals that are companies that are looking to um, pretty much uh, how if they need help on how to apply for a copyright and they want to um, uh, apply for um, a copyright in their work and they might need guidance on how to complete that gap, that application with the with the office and whatnot. So on occasion, the U.S. Copyright Office issues what are called statements of policies, and their, car, their, their policies throughout have pretty much um, long required that works must be of human authorship. And their current policy to date um, says to qualify as work of authorship, a work must be created by a human being that it, that it will not register works produced by a machine or mere mechanical process that operates randomly or automatically without any creative inter, input or intervention by a human author. So through their policies and their policy statements, um, we can pretty much see that the US Copyright Office is not going to issue a copyright to anything <laughs> other than a human being. So um, from there, I kind of took a step back and went in a slightly different direction and looked at, um, I looked at contracts because then I thought, well, most professional writers, after they write, whether it's a book or an article, the next thing they want to do is they want to publish it. They're going to work with publishing houses. And then to order to publish it, well, you need, need to enter into contracts. Um, it's just the nature of the publishing business. And in order to enter into contracts, one must be able to make some independent decisions. And I guess the legal buzz term there is there needs to be mutual assent between the two parties on the agreement of what's going into the terms of 
the contract, the publishing contract to publish the work. And AI is not at the point where they're able, where it can give assent and um, mutual assent and have independent decision-making. And um, I do not believe that publishing houses are um, contracting with AI. So between these two um, kind of these, what these, that I, the, between contracts and the U.S. copyrights um, office's policies, I kind of I just came to the conclusion: well, AI is not going to be considered a legal author. Um, the legal authors that we we have, according to the statements of the policies from the U.S. Copyright Office, uh, need to be human. They need to be human beings. So um, in slide three, I talked about, and my next focus, which was um, part two of my project, was, well, what, how is AI producing literature now, today? Like, what is, how does it work? Because I knew very little about it. And I specifically looked at chat GPT. And I also specifically looked at um, a study that was completed by a university students in Madrid, Spain. And a group of university students in Madrid, Spain, um, what they did is they um, did a project where they taught chat GPT how to um, pretty much emulate the style of an author. His name was um, H.P. Lovecraft. He was known as the father of cosmic horror in the 1920s. So maybe he was the Stephen King of his time. Um, either way, the students fed him about six, fed chat, GDP, chat GPT about 60 um, of short stories and other stories, um, some uh, 60 works of HP Lovecraft to the to chat GPT and pretty much taught chat GPT Lovecraft style in addition to teaching a little bit about setting and plot and writing literature. And then the research students went out to um, a sample size of about 300 university students and showed the university students um, H.P. Lovecraft's original work, which none of them were familiar with to begin with because this was an author from another time, and also showed them work that was produced by AI or chat GPT. And what they found is that the students could not tell the difference. So it was um, shown that AI was able to be taught another author's literary style and produce it and produce it in a way and at a level that there weren't they weren't able to distinguish from the original author. And I also took a look at, well, how are authors or professional writers today using AI? And that's where there's quite a spectrum. Um, it can run to very minimal involvement to um, a tremendous involvement. <clears throat> and um, so initially, I, for example, maybe the minimal involvement was when an author might be writing a book about, say, World War II. And the author might want some assistance in terms of doing some research to know about a particular place in time, what was happening in that, that place. So maybe some research on a setting in uh, a certain place in World War II, and they might use AI for that research. Um, that where I would see is maybe more of a minimal involvement with AI. <clears throat> now on the total opposite end of the spectrum is a great involvement um, where you take someone who pretty much says, well, I've always wanted to be a children's author. I'd love to be a children's author. So I took AI, and I just came up with this theme and I said, write me a book about this for children. And AI produced that entire book. And then the person said, well, then I took my book and I went out on a self-publishing platform and I self-published the book and now I'm a children's author. And so I see that as the maximum involvement where, uh, where someone who isn't an author is becoming an author. So those were sort of the different um, uses that I see today for AI in, um, in literature at this point. And then the next thing I looked at, um, or slide four, was I looked at, well, what, yeah, I wanted to sort of think about well, what makes for great literature? What do we consider great literature? And this is where I started to, uh, I, I did a few things. And initially I went out to literary magazines and I started to study their submission guidelines, which I've already done before. And I've, um, 
And I saw, um, okay, well, it looks like they all seem to have this reoccurring theme where they're asking for, we want fresh, new, original voices. And I kept hearing that word over and over again, original. We want original uh, voices. We want fresh, new, original voices. And time and time again, and it started to make me think, I'm like, well, from the, looking at the research study that the students did in Madrid, you know, it, what they're, they're, they're teaching AI to emulate, to copy. It, AI is not really an uh, original voice. Um, and then I also just took a look at some quotes from people who are authors who have produced some of the greatest literature, who are still living, <laughs> and have produced some of the greatest literature that we have today. And if you think about, too, um, what are maybe some of the books that you consider are the greatest works of literature of our time? And you know, what do these books have in common? And if you think about it, um, well, first of all, most of these books are born of human experience. I mean, might, some of them might talk about the future. Um, and robots taking over the world and things of that nature, but um, it's still the humans are involved in that, and it's it's based from human experience. But the unfortunate thing, though, is it's usually based from human suffering. Um, and so, you know, that came to me, and I uh, kind of like a lightning bolt to sort of maybe question: Well, how is AI? <laughs> um, how does AI suffer? <laughs> um, and then, so in slide five, then I started to look at, think about, um, well, what are what are the people, the teachers out there that are teaching writing, teaching students how to write, and what are their thoughts on this? And I took a, a look at an article from a person who is a screenwriter. And that was an interesting article because it was talking about, well, I can only teach so much. I can, you know, teach my students how to write um, screenwriter, write to, to who want to be screenwriters and want to produce blockbuster films. And I can only go so far. And he felt that the ones that are able to produce the blockbuster films, well, it seems like there's a pattern there. They always have suffered some sort of trauma. Maybe it's a childhood trauma or some kind of trauma in their past, but they've taken that pain and that suffering experience and they've produced a great film. Um, so it's interesting how that carried from not only in books and uh, with great literature, but also in film. And then I also took a look at um, a writing professor in, uh, at a university and what were his thoughts on AI and writing um, and AI producing literature. And, and of course he was talking about, well, all my college students are really excited because yes, they just wanna have AI um, delegate their writing assignments and have AI produce their, their homework assignments. Um, but his, his comment about that was that, well, unfortunately they cannot delegate empathy. And um, he felt that while, you know, the students can do this to a point, um, some of the, the, what, you know, this is a creative writing class and be able to produce some of the more creative writing, and they're not going to be able to tell AI how to evoke empathy in, in their readers when reading the story. And that he felt was a, a difficulty. So in conclusion, um, looking at going back to the, the first part of my, um, my project, um, I would have to say that because of the policy statements that are being issued from the U.S. Copyright Office, that only humans are going to be deemed the legal authors of written work. Um, there's going to be significant challenges there for AI to be considered the legal author of work. Even if AI is used as part of the work, it's the humans that will be considered the legal authors of the work. And then really more for the, the uh, third part of my, um, my project, I, I felt that because um, it's pretty obvious that great literature is born of human experience and human suffering, um, that it will be a challenge for AI to produce um, great literature on that level. And in its greatest form, um, literature teaches us empathy and has the potential to make readers better human beings. Um, and AI in all its advances um, is not going to live the human experience and AI is not going to suffer. And therefore it is likely that humans will remain the better storytellers. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jay Soglo and I'm a graduating senior 
at the MPS and Publishing Program here at George Washington University. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for being in attendance to this really important um, event for the publishing industry. Um, I am just another student who was really moved and uh, impassioned after finding out about the record number of book bans. Um, and much like Haley's uh, excellent capstone um, presentation, I also wanted to discuss confronting book bans, but from a utilitarian uh, ethical framework. I originally wrote this capstone essay uh, last summer for the ethics and publishing course led by the illustrious Mr. Randy Towson. And as many of us remember, last summer was really fraught with um, multiple tragedies and mass shootings, uh, some of which were racially motivated. Um, my original, my essay originally covered several issues in the current culture wars kind of embroiling our country uh, at this moment. Um, and it was really a way for me to process a lot of my emotions, my grief and sadness resulting from the events at the time, mainly the uh, Buffalo grocery store shooting uh, was very fresh in my mind at the time of uh, this writing. Um, and the understanding that the shooter had a manifesto um, that was kind of detailing his twisted ideology, what kind of stuck with me as an example of how publishing can be misused um, and spread, you know, the kind of the wrong ideas. And I became fixated on the idea of what can we in the publishing industry do um, as a response to these book bans and how we can respond to kind of um, the darker sides of publishing, such as these uh, these kinds of manifestos. So since then, I continued to refine my capstone essay um, into this band, but not beaten, confronting book bans from a utilitarian, utilitarian perspective, uh, with the intention of submitting it to the George Washington uh, University Journal of Ethics. Uh, as we heard previously in Haley's excellent presentation, book banning has made a very concerning resurgence across many US states, um, most of which targeting books that promote diverse ideologies, diverse identities, and anti-racism. Um, a book that I uh, based a lot of my research on was Burning the Books by Richard Ovenden. Uh, and that work detailed kind of the cyclical nature of book bans and the destruction of knowledge over the course of human history, uh, going quite deeply into events like the sacking and destruction of the Library of Alexandria and um, the Nazi occupation and Kristallnacht. It was a tough read uh, seeing a lot of the parallels between those horrible events and now, but it was very informative. And I encourage uh, anyone who is also passionate about combating book bans to um, give that a read. We also have the pleasure of having the author um, come speak to the book club. So I also encourage um, anyone in the audience who is interested to also uh, participate in the George Washington University Book Club. Uh, banned books often feature LGBTQ plus themes and are written by authors of color or in other minority groups. And many laws are now coming into existence that criminalize the distribution of certain books, uh, in particular, Florida's Stop Woke Act was an example of a more recent law that I found was um, aiming to obscure some of the more um, 
sordid parts of U.S. history that are important to know about. And at the time of the writing of my essay, there were nearly 1,500 books that were banned in the six-month period between June 2022 and December 2022. As of July 2023, Tennessee law made it a felony for publishers and booksellers to distribute obscene books to public schools. Typically, these types of bans were initiated by members of the local community, but the escalation to state legislators codifying these bans into law presents a serious threat to free expression. So many of these, um, many of these groups claim to uphold communal standards. Uh, book bans disproportionately and negatively impact already marginalized voices. A lot of these books are removed from student access before any kind of due process is carried out, and many of many times before they're even reviewed for object objectionable content in question. The recent surge of book bannings in the United States fails the utilitarian test of ethics. This ethical framework says that actions are moral if they promote the greatest good for society. Uh, while I was analyzing the book bans through this lens, it was clear to me that the harms outweighed any benefits. While these bans were supposedly upholding community values and were meant to protect children, something I do agree with, it, uh, it appeared to me that the benefits were quite minimal and actually in contrast were restricting intellectual discourse and did uh, disproportionate harm to many marginalized groups. An example of extensive and long lasting damage. So since the certainty, the duration and the intensity of harm caused by banning books was much greater than any supposed benefits, therefore book banning is unethical under utilitarian ethics and must be vigorously opposed to defend free expression. Restricting access to ideas inevitably limits intellectual discourse, discovery, and social progress in tangible ways, regardless of the stated intentions behind these restrictions. And once these bridges are torn down, uh, the bridges are joining diverse experiences and perspectives through literature, it's extremely difficult to rebuild. Uh, this was very concerning to me, but uh, I became fixated with ideas of how we can fight back against these book bans. And something that really stuck with me as I was writing and researching uh, this presentation was uh, literacy as a subversive act, kind of how can we, rebel but for a good cause against um, these organizations and state governments that wanted to take away this kind of freedom and access to knowledge from schools and children. So publishers have resources and platforms to vigorously defend the availability of literature. Even when that contains, that means that they contain unpopular or challenging ideas. Well, just some examples of what publishers can do um, is to, first of all, take a bold and principled stand against censorship. Uh, I consider what we're doing now very much uh, a part of that. And even holding an ethics conference, uh, such as what we're attending now, is, is a great way of showing that we believe in taking a stand against censorship. It's also really important that uh, publishers and citizens who are concerned refuse to make concessions or voluntarily pull controversial books from shelves, if at all possible. We really want to force the censors to go through every formal process available. 
uh, to show that we mean business and also to give us uh, opportunities to um, fight back within the bounds of the law. Supporting authors who face bans and backlash is uh, paramount. Uh, we need to show them that we're not afraid of, um, of the opposition and that we believe in the positive messaging that they want to put out there. And so standing by them is incredibly important, even if that means that uh, we may need to provide security or additional support at, um, at live events if needed. And everyday citizens like myself or perhaps yourself can also speak out, um, not just on official forums like this conference, but online, in the community, social media, uh, PTA meetings, things of that nature. Advocating against policies and legislation that would limit access to books and ideas, uh, donating to funds and organizations that actively oppose book bans, and reading up on, um, on what can be done um, through uh, websites like PEN America and um, other organizations. We want to also encourage readers to purchase and read the banned books and form their own opinions about the content, not just um, you know, digest through osmosis what other people think or have to say about these works. Because it's important that not just children, but also the parents form their own opinions on what's appropriate for their own community and their own families. Um, and I will just leave you with a quote from The Handmaid's Tale, which is one of the top 10 banned books in several states. Uh, Margaret Atwood writes, better never means better for everyone. It always means worse for some. Thank you very much. I'm going to jump right in. My capstone is on the visual representations of underrepresented groups on YA book covers. Um, so what do we know so far? In 2014, We Need Diverse Books launched, which I feel like we've all heard of it. They pointed out how few diverse books were published for children and YA audiences and ever since then I've been thinking about how uh, even if we have diverse books readers need to know that they're there. Um, in 2016 I did a deep dive looking for data on a cover on covers in this area to see if there's been improvement or not. There was absolutely no data at that point though. In 2018 Jenny Kimura completed her capstone, a cover is worth a thousand words, visibility and racial diversity in young adult cover design. Her study focused on covers that have one individual on them and how vis visible that individual is. So it was a scale that could be rated out of five based on how close to the cover or how um, covered up the individual was shadows. Um, so diversity, the big blanket term at this point, but I wanted to focus on three areas. One, continuing Ginny Kimura's racial diversity work. Um, and if anyone needs a under better understanding of racial diversity, start with Bishop's Windows and Mirrors, Children's Books, and Parallel Cultures. But there's so much out there that I can't get into right now. So I also wanted to add queer diversity, which should be a, uh, a category with many subcategories. Um, disability diversity is also one that has been overlooked extremely. Um, for the queer diversity, I'm lumping a lot of things together, both because it is a category with many different ever-changing labels and a desire to not use labels, um, as well as 
who knows what the future will bring and what people are most comfortable with. So queer diversity includes all gender, sex, expression at this point. Disability diversity is one that I had not thought of very much. Um, and I advise you to take a moment to think of a book you've seen with a disabled person on a cover or a book you've read with a disabled character that you can't find any mention of it on there, on the paratext of the book. Um, so I believe that a lot of publishers currently don't think that disabled characters on books will sell, um, which I do not believe is true in any way. I have noted that several of the most popular, um, based on what I've seen on social media um, in this category, often leave out the fact that there are disabled characters. Um, some of the more famous ones, Turtles All the Way Down by John Green, doesn't even mention, uh, it only mentions thought spirals instead of saying mental health in the blurb. Um, and these other books are also give very small amounts of signal that there is any uh, ability um, issues for any of the characters. Um, so why did I focus on YA? Uh, it spans all genres, which is very important for different cover styles and trends. Um, it's also focused on big dramatic teenage feelings, which make uh, some things that would be more subtle in books focused on adult audiences, bring them more to the forefront. Uh, Cheryl Klein has a more specific definition of why that includes the following. Uh, the experience of the main character, a teenager, um, has to be crucial to the plot. The Their YA almost always has heavy character identification, which is also why we need more diverse stories. Um, it also should be written in a show, not tell style, having more dialogue and all the events um, serve a purpose in the plot. I, before I read this definition, just thought of it as a very specific YA fast pace. Um, YA books are also purchased 55% of the time by adults, which is either for their own reading purposes or as a gift to a younger person. And 45% are purchased by teens, which makes this um, audience very wide ranging. All right, YA covers. So a cover is the part of the book that you see first, especially now that many much book shopping happens online you see the little thumbnail if you find it interesting you click on it or if you're at a bookstore you pick it up and read the back beyond the cover there are a lot of things that are very important um i found some studies on how paratext which is everything that surrounds the text itself and gives you hints to what the book is about um including book covers in papers, titles, et cetera. Um, so I thought it was important with how certain books are ignoring uh, disability representation and other representations in their blurbs. Um, beyond the cover, there are several reasons um, that trends and other things have kept diverse images off of cover. Um, so there's some self-censoring that happens. Often with book bans, publishers are trying to either make it less obvious so that they don't get banned or make it less obvious so that there isn't any sort of commercial blowback or anything. There's also an amount of following trends. You see a lot of like illustrated covers in a certain genre or covers with women with only the bottom half their head showing. Um, so these sort of trends can often lead to a lot of similar looking book covers that can focus on 
anything, but which often follow the trends that publishers have set up of only having very whitewashed covers. Um, the metadata and tags can be both help uh, readers find these books, but also make it more difficult. I have noticed that on Goodreads as well as other places with uh, readers doing the tagging themselves is that there is a lot that gets ignored as well as books with out what I would really call representation being included. Uh, a lot of the Beverly Cleary Ramona books, which are wonderful, but they're not super diverse, have been tagged with uh, various diverse things because of like one sentence or a mention of a neighbor, um, which isn't really what people are searching for when they use tags. Um, the last thing is who packages the book. Publishers for years have been saying that they're the reader needs to identify with the cover, which has previously meant that a lot of the covers have been whitewashed um, because the publisher thinks that's more money, which is not true. Um, so what am I adding to this study? I already mentioned that I'm adding disability and queer inclusion to the representation that I'm examining. I am looking at covers with groups as well as covers without people because Representation does not mean that the cover has to have a person on it. That's unreasonable and boring design. Um, so one other thing that I'm adding on, which has made uh, the data collection more difficult, is what I'm calling signals. Signals are any element on a cover that will signify a certain low representational group. Um, I've been seeing a lot of coded jewelry or fashion trends, color palettes and fonts that are coded slightly towards groups. Uh, architecture and wildlife is another aspect that mainly has uh, prevalence in more historical novels. Um, so my data, I've only looked at 50 covers in depth for these samples. So we can see the directions that trends are going, but until I'm done, I won't have any statistically significant data. Um, so racial diversity over time has been <laughs> um, has, looks like it is improving at a very slow rate, um, especially if you focus on the, it looks as if uh, books with white characters are going down about 2% less of majority. Um, the shrinking of the unclear slash non-white um, unclear category shrinking bodes better for me, bodes better for my uh, understanding that we are hopefully getting more specific diversity and being able to locate that diversity. Um, the racial diversity broken down by publisher has a similar skew. Um, I have in the brief amount of data that I have compiled, it looks like we're getting an increase in percentage of Asian books, Asian representation. I don't know if this is, will continue as I gather more data. Um, so here's the bibliography, which is a little scary to look at in this form. Um, thank you for listening. And if you would like uh, to read the full paper in its draft form, you may email me at vlanemelcom at gwu.edu and the bibliography is much easier to read there. Thank you. I'd like to remind everybody to put questions into the interact button that you'll find on the conference site. So please add questions there for our panelists. Thanks, all of you, Jay, Haley, Tara, and Violet. And Randy, I'll give it over to you again. Yeah, no, thank you. I invite um, the panelists to turn their cameras back on. Um, we'll open up for some discussion. 
Uh, I have questions, but uh, please do let me know, John. Uh, I don't think I can see if questions come in. Let me know if anything from the audience comes in. Um, Jay, I think you have a question first, so I'll, I'll pause before I throw my questions out there. Uh, yeah. Uh, first of all, I also want to say that everybody did an excellent job, in my opinion. And uh, my question was for uh, Tara because I uh, love learning more about AI. I was interested in hearing uh, how can publishers ensure transparency and accountability when an author uses AI-generated content in their work? So um, I would say that's really going to be an individual policy decision for each publisher. And I'm sure all of them are going to be very challenged in how their different responses to that. I think they're going to, number one, have to have an in-house policy of, on what they're going to allow. Like, for example, when I was talking about the author that said, well, I used AI to help me research um, the setting of the book that I'm working on with World War II. And then, well, is um, you know, it's going to be questionable. Well, is that publishing house going to then maybe potentially say, well, this book was written by this author? And, and AI. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if they're going to disclose that or not. And if they're going to, you know, put on the book jacket that maybe um, AI has also been involved with this. Um, I think first the publishing houses have to set their own policies. Um, some are probably um, going to say, well, we might allow you to do that, but then we're gonna, we're gonna also, you know, do um, fact checking. We're gonna check your AI because, at this time, still, AI is known to be making mistakes. Um, I don't know if we're ever going to know that AI is not going to make mistakes. And, um, you know, the huge editorial departments are are still fact-checking AI. You know, if they're going to put their resources into, say, a book about World War II, I, I don't think they're just going to say, oh, well, we'll accept what AI tells us about it. Um, and I don't know that, um, you know, they're really at the point where, where there's... Uh, a lot of disclosure, unfortunately. I mean, my answer to you is that there should be disclosure, but I don't know if there is. But I'll also say in doing my presentation, I mean, I learned, I, I didn't know that there there is a whole section on say Amazon where there's just books by AI and it literally lists, you know, AI as the, the author. Um, but that's, you know, AI can't get a copyright in that. So, um, but but AI is listed as an author. But I think it gets a lot more complicated with the question that you bring up when it's like, well, it's more of a, uh, you know, a combo situation. There's an author and there's an AI. And what do you do with that one? Um, and that's going to be up to each publishing house and whether they're going to disclose that this, you know, the author wrote the book and they used AI to help with the research. And, and then how if they're going to disclose that the author used AI and, and then how are, you know, what exactly did AI do to produce this? And I think it, my opinion on that is disclosure, full disclosure, kind of if there's a little sentence about the author, you know, there's usually a bio about the author, but maybe there's just a few sentences that, that said, and, and the author used AI to help with the assistance of, um, you know, looking at the setting, researching the, the setting. And I guess it'll be up to the individual readers to choose whether they put that book down and say, oh, I'm not reading this, or if they, you know, pick it up and say, oh, that's fine, you know, kind of thing. But I mean, I still think, you know, with the amount of resources and, you know, the money that goes into producing books, that um, the editorial departments of those books are still going to check AI's research and, and how AI is, you know, putting forth what they're putting forth, say, about the setting of um, to help an author in a book. Let's hope they do, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, John Pooja, is there anything from the audience? Any questions from the audience? Okay. Does any of the panelists have another question for another panelist? All right, so I have a question. I actually have tons of questions and probably more questions than we have time for. Um, but I was wondering, and this question is for Haley, um, do you know um, if there were, if any of the book bans or challenges found their way into the courts? Have there been any real challenges to the obscenity laws um, that have been negotiated 
that we can point to and say, well, this has been determined, so this is the direction we need to take, or this is what we need to fight against? Anyone that I'm aware of that has actually had a ruling, because there are several things that are being litigated right now, but the only one that actually has a ruling was last month in Texas, um, the rating system that the governor had signed into law, which was mainly requiring the vendors to rate the books with the state having final veto power on that, um, was blocked because the judge said, well, you know, I can sympathize with wanting to protect children, but this law is incredibly vague and there's no direction on how to implement it. And the burden is falling all or entirely on the vendors. And it's just too hard. It's too vague. And they don't know what to do. So that's where that's at. Everything else is just so brand new. And if you follow the news, there's just, there is not a day that I think that goes by that I'm not seeing something about book bans. It's really, really intimidating to try to keep up on all of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it sounds like that may be something we can point to in the future to say, well, you know, this, this should take the burden off of, or the pressure off of um, everyone that's trying to force these bands through and say, well, that's not the direction we really want to go in because yeah. it's really not reasonable. In my mm -hmm. opinion. Yeah. But, um, I agree. <laughs> um, Jay, something I want to, to mention to you. So um, with your presentation, I know we had discussions around the Buffalo massacre and we, we talked about some difficult topics like the replacement theory and the different manifestos. Um, so in, in your opinion, I really like the way you framed your presentation, uh, but in your opinion, um, what steps can publishers take to kind of drown out that kind of rhetoric or, um, or and elevate more constructive themes? That's a good question, Randy. Um, what immediately comes to mind for me is um, content moderation, clear content guidelines for authors, and um, diverse and inclusive editorial teams. Uh, I, I believe that there are ethical use cases for AI, and one of these may be automating content moderation. So for example, if you go to chat GPT or, or one of the many tools and you try to ask it something wild, it will most likely not allow that because it's programmed not to um, disperse like harmful and, and dangerous information and rhetoric. There are ways around that, unfortunately, but I believe that they're working on ways to to fill in those gaps. And it it could be um, really helpful in just quickly scanning through and processing uh, thousands or even millions of, of of uploaded publications for dangerous and harmful rhetoric. Um, maybe we'll even see a day where it can automatically redact those parts of it so people don't see them. Mm -hmm. Clear content guidelines um, that are comprehensive and explicitly forbid hate speech, and bigotry of any kind and discrimination, uh, making those known to like every contributor um, will just let publishers make a stand and uh, have be clear about what they accept and what they don't accept and uh, will possibly even deter people with uh, kind of like bad actors who want to um, put out that kind of harmful stuff from even trying with certain platforms. Um, also, uh, diverse and inclusive editorial teams um, will kind of inherently ensure that different perspectives and voices are considered uh, to kind of help avoid maybe like unintentional bias, um, but also would have um, like a built-in, for lack of a better word, let's say firewall <laughs> against uh, harmful content. And they'll, they'll most likely just leave that stuff out. Mm -hmm. uh, those are kind of the top three things that immediately come to mind. Great. Thank you for that, Jay. 
John, do we have time for one more question or is it time to to wrap it up? I think it's I think we're at time. We have time for we have time for another question. Yeah. Oh, good, because I didn't want to leave Violet out of out of <laughs> Violet, you um you had a lot of data for for your um presentation and your project. And I know we've been having discussions around expanding diversity on, on multiple levels, but it seems like we're still moving the needle very, very um, slowly. Is there like what? It's for me. It's hard to believe we have such a fast, accelerated pace with AI. But for something that we've been talking about in this context, we're moving so slow. Is is if you had if you could magic wand it, what is maybe one or two things that we could do to accelerate um, expanding diversity? in these areas that you you researched um, so that we can see better representation in YA fiction? Um, yeah, there's several things that would are actually fairly easy to implement. Um, one of them is in the Jenny Kimura article uh, that just turning uh, individuals so you can see more of their face or not cutting them off or less shadows over specifically identifiable things. Um, I also ran into some discussions about how uh, stock photos are actually uh, making it more difficult for uh, authors who write about uh, historical romances about people of color there's very little available. So if they want to show that on their cover, um, show their characters on their cover, they either have to shell out for their own photo shoot or whitewash. And um, so there are certain people that are trying to start Kickstarters to develop a specific stock photo bank for this, but it doesn't seem to be going anywhere quickly. Um, but the other thing is just having designers that feel more comfortable using more signals and don't shy away from these things that mark characters as being an individual group and need to realize that, that doesn't exclude readers who aren't in that group. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, Violet. Um, sorry, we do have uh, a couple of questions from um, the interact button um, we just got. Sorry, uh, I'll go ahead with them. So um, I would like to say I loved all these presentations. My question is for Violet. I know your study is ongoing, but I was curious about how you are looking at diversity from big publishers. Do you look at how often diverse characters are on the page? Like, for example, one character is mentioned on 100 pages, or do you look at who is the main character to determine these statistics? I'm really curious about that. Thank you very much. Great work from all of you. I would love to have been able to get that deep. Um, the data I'm collecting right now just has to do with the paratext, um, which the first section of it, I look at the book with the cover thumbnail as small as it is on a Goodreads list um, and fill out to a certain chunk. And then I get deeper and do a more thorough reading of the blurbs and the tags and see how that lines up. If I had all the time in the world, I would have read every book and been able to like dive really deep and see how many mentions of various things, but it just wasn't possible. So I focused on paratext. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have one additional question, and that's probably about all we have time for, but we'll see. Um, on the topic of AI content moderation, do you feel like the developers are having success with reducing human bias that is recreated by the material the software is trained on? And I'm not sure exactly who that's geared towards, but anybody that wants to answer that. Uh, I would say in, in my research, I wasn't quite focused on that topic because I wasn't um, 
in re in my research of AI, I was looking at whether AI can be considered a, a legal author um, and how writers were using it and how it was advancing. Um, I know, you know, they're they're trying to um, take out and, and continuously improve AI, um, obviously, and do exactly what that question talks about um, in in terms of being able to weed out. Um, just because I think AI was initially producing um, very, if it was was not going against copyright infringement, it was produce it was taking things that were in the public domain, um, and then it was being kind of archaic in that way. Um, but I I don't know if um, you know it, it, AI is going to continue to advance, um, but AI is going to be programmed by humans, so um, there's human bias as we learned from Professor Randy's class, <laughs> right, and Professor Townsend's class. So um, we know with human bias and humans programming AI, we're gonna have AI, we're gonna have bias in AI still. Um, so I, I don't know how you eradicate that um, until you can eradicate human bias. I'm happy to just add to that. Um, you know, I think there's an opportunity there for um, more training. You know, a lot of people, when they hear AI, they are like, they think, oh, I'll be, it's going to take my job. I'm not going to have a job anymore. But I think there are certain skills that we can adjust to, to make the, the use of AI a little bit more valuable. So um, where Tara mentioned, you know, the, there's always going to be human bias. Absolutely. But, you know, hopefully we'll do more and more trainings for, so that we can be aware of those biases and hopefully reduce the impact of those biases. But I think it presents the opportunity for more sensitivity readers or more people to come in and identify those areas where the AI is, is um, misbehaving, so to speak, um, and make those corrections so that the, the overall product is improved. Um, so it's not all it's not all bad. There's opportunities there. We just need to change our frame of mind a little bit. With that said, I think we're at time, maybe a little bit over. I really, really want to thank um, my panelists for for joining. They were great. You all were fantastic in class. I really appreciate you all agreeing to join me on this panel. Um, Haley Baker, Tara Jacoby, Jay Soglo, and Violet Lane Ruckman. Thank you so much.